Okay, colleagues, good afternoon to everybody. Um, a special word of welcome to, of course, Professor Esop, who's going to be the speaker at this afternoon's teaching and learning seminar, the second in a, in a, in a range of four teaching and learning seminars throughout the year. But also a very special word of welcome to our international guests that are joining us. It's not often that we have guests from FutureLearn here today. So Mark, Monty and Matt, um, they're visiting our university at the moment, collaborating and talking all strategic things and seeing where we want to take the partnership. So a special word of welcome to them as well. But then it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Fadio Esop to you. Professor Esop is a professor based within the Department of Physiological Sciences in the Faculty of Science, where his key focus areas include cooperative and active learning in relatively large classes. He is passionate about creating a teaching and learning environment that is conducive to critical thinking, problem solving and a deeper understanding of subject content. In terms of his physiological in research interests, his team focuses on cardiometabolic diseases such as coronary heart disease and diabetes. More recently he has initiated a research project that investigates the impact of psychosocial stress on the heart and is keen to also expand this focus into the teaching and learning sphere. Okay, I got through all those big words, I'm <laughs> really happy. <laughs> but anyway, so Professor Esop, we really look forward to your talk this afternoon on autonomy pathways to compare active teaching methods in undergraduate physiology. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Classes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, so much for that kind introduction. And good afternoon to everybody. Um, as mentioned, um, I'll speak a little bit about autonomy pathways in part, because I'm also just starting this journey. But I'll mix it in with some of the active teaching strategies that we employ in, in the department, particularly in my own interests. So I thought to start right at the beginning. What is physiology? Does anybody know? <laughs> if you don't look at the slides. Physiology is looking basically at function. That's the key thing. Function of, from the cellular level, the individual cell, cells make up tissues and organs, how they function. Okay, so we're interested in that. And um, our questions would therefore focus on understanding the functioning of the human body and our interactions with the external environment. Because we don't live in a vacuum, we face daily stress source in our lives. Stress is one of them, psychosocial stress, diet, exercise, all kinds of things. And so that would have a particular impact on the functioning of cells, organs and the entire organism. So you're in either going to be well or not well, depending on that. Okay. So a key concept in physiology is homeostasis. I don't know if you remember, <laughs> some time ago maybe. From the Greek word, there's two terms, homeo and stasis. And in essence meaning the same condition, same standing, a sort of internal balance within the human body. And this is one of the big um, concepts in physiology, probably the biggest one. And so what does it mean? I'm faced with a stressor. My body has got the ability to adapt, integrate those signals, and I'm, I can respond to that. Whether it's stress, I can increase my heart rate, the brain will talk to the heart, to the kidneys, and so forth. If that gets overwhelmed, however, or there's consistent chronic stressors, those systems would be overwhelmed, the homeostasis would not be adequate, and I'm not well, and disease would be the onset. So the big concept is homeostasis, and so you can see from that what I've explained, there's a lot of integration of signals, communication within the system between various organs, and so these are important, you may think this is a physiology <laughs> lecture, <laughs> But I'm, I'm making those key points for later on, why, why it's important. Okay. And, and so we come on to some of those things. Some of the challenges we face within teaching and learning in, in the physiology domain, and this is at main campus, there's another physiology also at the med school. It's the discipline itself. As you may also experience within your disciplines, 
some surveys show that it's a hard subject. So, so what do we mean with hard? Just search this now. Difficult to comprehend or explain, or you need a great deal of effort to understand that. Okay. So why would that be the case? And so in the literature, if you look at some of the factors, I think it just apply universally. It's either the discipline there's something, <laughs> physiology, okay, or the way we teach, or what the students bring in terms of their prior learning and experiences to your classes. It, it sort of, if you're trying to find the fault, it must lie somewhere in between there. And so there was a survey done, I don't know if you can see that, of faculty. This was done in the United States, and they had 17 parameters that they looked at, and they could rank them. Remember the three previous points that I've listed, to see where the problems would lie. And so in the top 10 of those, they found the absolute majority, the problem lies either with a student or the discipline. That, that's sort of <laughs> from the faculty side. So you're laughing already because <laughs> we, we exclude ourselves. So these are some of the points that came up uh, and in terms of rank. So students lack the ability to reason and to think, as we call it, mechanistically. They fail to integrate, just what I said earlier. They, they lack this ability, the physiology. Compartmentalize everything. Because you're taught in physiology, this is the heart module, this is the brain module, this is the muscle. Three weeks, six weeks. But they cannot bring it together. And they think learning equals memorization, all the facts. And we've got a lot of content in physiology to cover. We do the entire body over two years. And then sort of later down in the ranking, at least, this came up. <laughs> Teachers <laughs> talk too much. <laughs> okay. And students <coughs> too little. Okay, so. so you can see this is sort of what the faculty feels. <coughs> Number two, I think, is the generation gap also between the lecturers, those who transfer the knowledge. Apologies, I don't know if I've covered all the generations in this room. <laughs> it's not on purpose. But baby boomers, loyalty, hard work. I work for 40 years, get a gold watch. What else? Optimism, sacrifice. Good, good values there. <laughs> Generation X. Similar, independence though, pragmatic, self-sufficient. So these are all important as we get. So those are the, that's us basically, if, if I've covered that correctly. But the guys who receive the message. So this is another study I'd like to do at some point also, to look at Generation Z. The guys that's sitting now in our classes, they like teamwork. We just saw independence before. Instant gratification. Less focused, you've seen them looking at cell phones while you're talking and so forth. Really multitaskers, that's how they <laughs> describe. Can they look at the phone and listen to you? I'm not so sure. Relevance, they need to know what does this mean? Why am I doing this to myself and the world? Because they are global generation, globally connected. And they aspire to change things. So the knowledge must not just be knowledge. It must mean something and how can we change the world. And authority, the world is flat. Hi, when will my marks be ready? <laughs> 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 not dear professor, <laughs> how are you? Um, so if we look at how we convey this message. So this is a nice image of the Smithsonian Institute lecture. 160. 160 years ago. Professor in the front and the class there, obviously. The expert, like we're having now, <laughs> allegedly, and then you guys listen. <laughs> okay. um, has that changed dramatically over the 160 years? The spaces we use. I see we're getting a new, new teaching and learning uh, facility, so maybe that will change. And in that world, the Mind is a vessel that you've got to fill. And I, my job is to do that, and you regurgitate that back to me, and you clear that. So I thought about this and think that we've got this big
big role as teachers and lecturers, that we work with human potential. And isn't our job then to ignite that potential? Set it alight so that we can create people who will go out there and transform society. So, so that's the framework, you see. And another person that struck me also along this journey is, it's cut off at the bottom, a guy at Michigan State University. And I had the privilege to listen to one of his talks. And he said that it's about more than the content. Sometimes we caught up content versus the things we want to do. But I've got to cover the syllabus, you see. I had that same problem. Okay? It's about, he felt it's creating joy, excitement, and love for learning. I can't see this thing now. Okay. And it's about making learning fun as well. So we should actually have fun in classes, both the students and ourselves. I'll explain why fun is important. As well, it's more important to inspire and motivate students than just delivering information. Okay, so we've got to bring that as well if we're going to look at this whole thing, uh, how to approach active learning methods in physiology and beyond, I think. <coughs> This slide I show to all my classes. I think I'll share it with you. It's one of my favorite studies. <laughs> Ten-year study done in Canada, especially relevant for us in South Africa. We're quite pessimistic. I don't know in the UK now with Brexit, perhaps. <laughs> um, we always see the glass less full. So they just looked in this study at, they call it positive effects, your outlook on life. So this would include purely emotions such as joy, happiness, excitement, enthusiasm, content. And they followed these guys for 10 years. And they did assessments for blocked arteries. <laughs> and those who had positive, all those uh, um, outlooks, had far less blocked arteries. There's a big gap, obviously. Nice research study. How does it go from there to there? So when I try and bring in these new interventions, I always put this up to my students and say, listen, I'm here actually to help you. <laughs> I'm doing you a favor because I want you to live longer. I'm actually here for your well-being overall. That's why I'm doing this. <coughs> so, <laughs> and they appreciate that. <laughs> and by the way, they did a follow-up study on anger. But uh, you can ask me afterwards. But I think you can predict the outcome. And then just to, to note that others have said likewise, that we look at the core, this is not of your interest specifically, but we focus on core context in the discipline of physiology versus absolutely just the content. And that we use this to really teach our classes. That's the, that's the essence of it, okay? Versus the massive content we try and cover in a lecture. And Barbara Goodman did an article, this is now physiology specifically, where she tries to move us towards active teaching in physiology. And some of the points she made is that we should move more to active approaches than the traditional lecture, the Smithsonian type of model. Meaningful learning, where we bring in problem solving, okay, in our case. And that our job as the instructor would be to create an environment where real and deep learning can occur versus superficial memorization. That's the problem that we face. That You can teach that. They study for the test and exam. Three weeks later, I could ask that person a detailed lesson. I forgot that. I did that, I did that for, the, for the exam. <laughs> Gone. So we're interested in deeper learning and retention. So I think, too, that's my sort of, I'm trying to cook up the perfect storm within this framework when I approach <laughs> physiology <laughs> undergraduate teaching, so with all of that in mind. You see. And that's sort of my place of work. It's not the ideal venue, you can see, to do these kinds of things. Steep lecture, <coughs> I've got about 220 plus students in the class. And now to bring in some of the active learning methods into this. Um, so I'll share a couple. I've got f more than this, but just a few, and then I'll show you how we applied LCT to that, to 
just to, to almost test these methods that have been employed. So the one is that during my lectures, <coughs> out of the blue, this, in fact, I would start off, say, it's getting a bit hot in the class. <laughs> Anybody getting hot? I feel very hot. Oh, there's a fire. <laughs> okay. And then there comes a case study that I've constructed myself. There's an elderly lady, etc., etc., with many. She's at the airport. Based on what we discussed in classes, you've got to explain to bystanders, crucially, what went wrong and what course of action you take. See. So, so then obviously I've got to now find volunteers. Pops up. Anybody interested? No, <laughs> nobody is very interested. <laughs> they start looking up, down. Et cetera. Eventually, you do get a couple, and normally, in tune with the Generation Z characteristics, two or three students would come up afterwards, and they volunteer, and they've got time until the next lecture. Just three slides or so. Research that. They can contact me by email. Come and see me, and and so they come back to the class. And during this time, I inform the class of my principle I call HWW. How does it happen? What? Why? Okay. <coughs> Why is it important? And they've explained it to laypersons. So again, why would that be important? And I quote Albert Einstein to them. <coughs> and I need to tell that myself as well. <laughs> if you cannot explain it, he said, to a six-year-old, then you don't understand it yourself. We cannot hide behind the jargon. I'm sorry, this is complicated. Maybe next time. No. So it's got to be, you've got to really know it well to explain it to bystanders. And in that time to also enhance this notion of self reflection and critical reflexivity in the students. Okay, so then they come back and they present quite enthusiastically. It's done also, remember, the theme is fun. So I instruct them, you've got to bring the content, but in a way that's also fun, where we could laugh and so forth. And they do quite well. They take that seriously, <laughs> present. I've, I had a clip, but I couldn't get it saved, where they present and the students would interact and we work it out together. So. And that's another question. So I've got throughout my modules a number of these questions that would pop up that they can tackle. And then for the first one or two, I would put up immediate feedback after they've presented. This is the answer. This is what I expect. And I also remind them at the bottom again about the principles of thinking critically, HWW, as you can see. And then I also invite them for assessments. They can bring in a written response for the next one. But there's no marks. It's um, cut off. Again, for the love of physiology, and it's good for your physical art. <laughs> okay. And uh, out of 200, you may get 40 or so that would come back and bring it. And so they would get assessment, and they can see whether their expectations and mine would be on the same page. And so now we move into legitimation code theory, which I'm just starting on this journey, but I'm glad Anli Ardendorf is there, who's basically helped me on this process. Um, but so we wanted to look at this, or LCT as it now is, which is basically a system where you can look at practices by looking at the principles that underpin these practices that, that we do sort of an objective assessment of what you do and to test in, in that way the utility of your practices. So it's a, it's, it's a nice tool and there's various domains that one can apply to, to your, what you want to study. So we've applied this autonomy domain, but there's semantics, I can't remember them all now. Um, to, to some of like, so to the burning questions would be one. How does this shape up? Remember, the objective would be to integrate information and to stimulate deeper thinking. Um, and this is a bit like, I think I only use this analogy, the genetic code. So we've got all DNA, and that determines our outcome to a large extent. 
So it would be to understand the principles, the DNA of our practices, and then to organize this into units or codes, and then to use objective measures to test your uh, practice in terms of those codes and targets. So there's, I said we use this autonomy plane, okay, dimension. So there's positional autonomy, I've got to just alert you to, to PA. So this is the discipline itself, right? practices within the discipline. So it would be, in my case, the discipline of physiology, or if it's the cardiovascular physiology. So it would be quite insular, that is what I... And I'm going to teach the curriculum of that. Okay? So that would be... And that can vary. You can have strong positional autonomy, it's really insular, or weaker when you move away from your strong discipline. And then you've got relational autonomy. So this would be almost what is these things and what would the purpose of all of this be? Strongly related to the purpose of what you're doing. Okay, so the physiology and, and it's leading towards the purpose of integration, for example, or for whatever purpose you're using those objects or material. And so you can draw this Cartesian graph here, and, and you've got different quadrants, you see, based on the levels of their relationship. So this would be strong positional autonomy, weak, strong relational auto autonomy, and weak. And so each quadrant has got a particular, so the sovereign would be strongly related to your discipline. So if it's physiology, the third year, cardiovascular module, um, strongly grounded, and if I'm going to be in this quadrant, that's going to be used to teach the curriculum specifically. So. But if you venture out of that, so the Trojan, it's still in this, do, uh, still the content, but you're applying it to a con uh, uh, context outside of, of your con uh, classroom setting. Okay? So the Trojan horse example. The exotic is you take information outside of physiology completely and for almost for no purpose related to your physiology content. It's more exotic. And then this one is the Roman one. When in Rome you do as the Romans do. Okay. So this would be again knowledge out of your domain but you've got a strong interest to use it for your purpose to teach ultimately your content. I don't know if that makes sense. It needs quite a lot of thought <laughs> and tricky. So that, that's the sort of the framework we can apply to, to the um, interventions I've used. Okay. So positional autonomy, just to refresh. So it's from within, inside the curriculum. Okay. The theories, the objects, the methods. PA minus, it's weaker, it's outside of, of your core. And for relational, the purpose you can make that what you want to. To learn physiology. Mine is strongly on integration, knowledge, problem solving. And to learn something other than physiology would be a weaker relational autonomy. And again, there's the, the, the graph, you see. So just, just to reinforce, physiology content for teaching physiology. If you move into this quadrant, you can teach a bit farther away from your physiology content, but still for the purposes of coming back to your curriculum. And this is applying your physiology content to something else, problem outside, and this is further removed, you see, much further, the exotic quadrant. So there's this paper I referred to earlier by Goodman, who spoke about the best practices for active learning in the classroom. So what we, what we did there is look at some of the things she suggested and plotted it on, on this plane. See. So that would be sort of the home base, physiology content for teaching physiology. Yeah, in this quadrant, you can remind students to problems they may have seen elsewhere. Mathematics, there's a graph or something that you could take. You remember this graph, but it relates back. Or chemistry, there's a particular equation that now applies to the blood circulation or something. And, and here you could move again from the basic physiology and you apply this to outside world context. So 
So that's sort of the, the quadrants that you use. And you can, she suggests, introduce case studies like I've done. So our study was done retrospectively. I did this already and then did the LCT. But one can do it prospectively, in a sense. So in our case, this is specifically what we focused on. Third year physiology, cardiovascular content. These were the targets. And also content from other physiology modules. And like I said, integration of knowledge to solve real world problems. That's the gist. So there's it plotted out. You see. There's the <coughs> case study, the elderly lady on the airport. And so that would move us from this quadrant onto that side. Because we're applying it on an outside scenario. Okay? And so you're moving now the student from there to there. And then I come back at the end and I show them the proper answers. And so this, it's thought, is a better way for them to learn and integrate information versus just saying, okay, there's this discipline, this discipline, and we're going to see, can we integrate? What does it mean? Versus actively moving. If you can have more of these movements, the theory would be that these students have a better and deeper understanding and integration of knowledge. So if you can, and, and these so-called tours, the movement is just called tours alternatively. So that's what I've done in hindsight, so to speak. And the students receive this very favorably. If you look at, we don't have time for all the comments, but forced to read, comprehend, real life examples, actually understand. Applying, it excited me, the fun. Critically promotes integrative learning. So we sort of, they're very enthusiastic about this thing. Very, very enthusiastic. You can see I had masses of feedback. Um, you need to try and understand everything you read. You see. Formulate one's own ideas if we want to ignite, like I said, the, the mind. And so forth. It goes on and on. Okay. Second one, because the time. So this one would come up up front in the class. So we'd start off, how are you guys feeling this morning? Phew. I just went for a lovely walk in the Yonkersuk Mountains. Gorgeous day. Ooh, we've got a problem there. So we found this Finnish girl has gone missing, and we need Stellenbosch University students to assist us, you guys in the class. And then so progressively I'll give them clues. Hello, guys. <laughs> what have we got on the path? You see there's something there. I knew my grandma uses this <laughs> to check <laughs> blood sugar. But there's a reading on there, 18.8. So now we stop a bit. What do you guys think? In fact, the, they, they'll ask them. Did she have something to eat? We found a banana and bread. Class laughing now. <laughs> so they're drawn into it. You see. And now we begin to discuss it in the class. What does it mean? 18.8, first give them a chance. They start talking, 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 until I come in. By the way, this professor was one first from just Googling. And they took this so seriously, one guy came later <coughs> and said, no, there were this, these characters, there's a specific professor. So I had to go and change it. <laughs> um, and so now you come in and you, first the 364 class who will assist us after the discussion. I bring in the theory. And so we go through that carefully. More clues. Got a call from the lab. Insulin levels not detectable. Okay. How does insulin fit in? Again, the class. And so we go back. Theory. More theory. Histological slides. Show them the slides. I'm stumped. <laughs> I'm really stumped. What do you guys think? So they must come in now. <laughs> we think A, B, C, D. And then, but before we go on, I say, listen, but we've got to go back into the past also. Because decolonization is also in my mind. How can we bring it into physiology? And we go back. Other people also document this. Frequent urination. India, they, they already ate sweet things then. <laughs> For 500 BC. Okay. 
Um, interestingly, that they ants congregated around the urine at that time. Middle, the <coughs> Middle East guys, and there was a nice job for the unemployed. Urine tasters, if you know, sweet urine. The GP could better treat you, obviously. You've got this disease. <laughs> Uh, and so, and then come back to the clinical outcomes, and at the end, this is almost the last lecture of the series of lectures, this runs over several lectures, we come to the end, so we've solved it, the problem as a class, there's even a finish goodbye, and <laughs> you've got to take it really seriously, <laughs> and we come to the end, and that's the, the mystery solved, you see. but then we can plot this, you see, and test how good is this in terms of a method to employ in terms of integrating problem solving, the main aim of all of these exercises. So there's the case. Then we bring in information into this plane. There's the bread and the reading, etc. Um, for the purpose to get to the actual facts, you see. But it's not really related so strongly to cardiovascular and then I come up with the actual info, the insular core content. Then I go back again into that quadrant, talk a bit about the history, and I come back again <laughs> and show them more facts. You see. And then we end up here also, because they had to apply all of this to find the goal at the end of the day. And the mystery we found is she's safe and secure. So again, one can plot the sort of tours or the movements. Now, only, I'm not sure if this fits exactly, I must talk later. But from there to there, <laughs> then we move from there to there, back there, back to the top, and across. See. So you're really moving around, and otherwise, the traditional lecture, you're just going to be stuck there. I'm just putting up slide after slide. But by moving them across these different quadrants, that leads to better integration, to a deeper understanding and problem-solving abilities. I've, time has run out. I just wanted to share this because I'm so enthusiastic. This is one student sent me this afterwards and said they had their own real burning life. This is actually what happened. <laughs> that uh, <coughs> my aunt and uncle, they got into these juices, etc. And this person went and did the research and advise them. And a real life burning question. <laughs> so it's exactly what we want. And like I said, that characterizes this generation. It must mean something and some application. A couple of slides more. This is the assessment also in tests and exams. If we're gonna apply these principles, we've gotta take it all the way through. So my papers are becoming quite long. <laughs> Lots of things and so there's uh, something that happened and your mom indicated the doctor used this term blah 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 explain what does your ejection fraction mean it requires Uncle Sophie so explain how did he become enlarged your mom it's a family meeting see, and you giving the answers it's out of their comfort zone but hopefully through those tours that we did through the autonomy tours they will can better integrate the information and so forth so I think collectively, the last slide is that, and I'm just starting on this journey, I think LC2 is a valuable tool for planning and analyzing research. And more importantly, to explain the value of what we're doing. Okay. And, and I think we've got a lot more to analyze like this. It's a student-centered approach, real-world context, and this is the crux, promotes integration, critical thinking, problem-solving skills. And the students love it. For, for us who apply it, is it easy? You've got to create a calm and safe environment. Inclusivity is important. People must feel free, there's no stupid question. It doesn't need money. The lecture halls are not ideal, but okay, we can make a plan. You've got to be sincere and authentic and truly believe in it and make it an inspirational experience. And that balance between content, because I'm losing time in the lecture. My colleagues, that's a sin. 
I'm giving up regularly time slots for this, and I think it's worth it, yeah. Um, so because you need to dedicate a significant amount of time, and like I said, it's got to be fun. Um, I have lots of fun. So teaching then is fun for the students, <coughs> and we live longer as well. <laughs> so that's my story, just also to th really acknowledge Dr. Ardendorf for her expertise and excellent assistance, as I'm just starting on the LCT journey. Thank you very much. I just want to make sure if there's any burning questions. I'm sure there's <laughs> quite a number of questions. We've got a roving mic that you just have to speak into. Well, thanks. It's it's not really that burning, but in, in terms of the quadrants, the the left one, um, bottom, where you you're straying away from the physiology and into the everyday. Um, I mean that's also important learning that happens, and there are things that happen in the media and the news and protests and decolonizing the curriculum and and a lot of learning in terms of <coughs> things that are maybe beyond the module but it's still the graduate attributes that you want to cover and you, you want to make sure that people are critical about other aspects other than physiology. So I was wondering um, how often do you stray in that sector and, and do you always go back and, and how do you make those judgments? There's the risk obviously with my nature to stray <laughs> in that quadrant and some people can get lost there and then there's obviously no meaning for the student so I think I've refined it now over the years. I think initially I did stray a bit far in that side. And if you don't bring it back, then you lose the student in terms of what you're actually there for also. But I think a couple of points. One is to get across general principles beyond physi physiology. So for me, it's beyond problem solving in physiology. It's problem solving in general. Because I also advise them that in the science, in terms of a degree, You've got to think wider when you graduate, because our job is to teach you to speak properly, to write properly, think properly. <laughs> and you can apply that in the bank. You don't have to do it in a laboratory. You'll get more money also. So I think for me it's beyond the physiology, so to try at times to bring in just the graduate attributes, which I've actually gone to look at also, and see how best one can bring that in but using physiology just as a tool to also get that across, so definitely. But I think one's got to be mindful, as you s say, that you don't stray too far. But I regularly would bring in those broader points uh, because I think our job is also to create people who will be employable at the end of the day and not just a specialist in a s small area. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I wanted to know, with your last slide, uh, I also use active approaches in my classroom and my students uh, work on these white page uh, boards in the class. But I would have wanted, the ideal for me is that each student or group would have had time to present something because it's in that presentations that, that a lot of learning also occurs. But I just find it very difficult to give every student a chance. So I would have groups explaining things to each other and then this group explain it to that group. But how do you manage getting, because I think that that's really what I would have loved to do. And how can one give more students the opportunity to present in front of a class? I always seem to battle with that question. It's a problem obviously depending on the numbers also. So this exercise will not allow that unfortunately because let's say I've got five weeks, I can maybe have 10 or 15 out of the 200. So I've got another activity where they pair share almost. Let me just see if I've got a few slides here. This one, I couldn't speak about it. So this one I would come in and put up again a case study in the class, but then I give them a specific amount of time. You've got 10 minutes, say, to answer all that. And then I go around in the class and ask people, 
who would volunteer to come to the front? Again in groups of say three, but you cannot unfortunately cover the entire spectrum. So that is a problem if you've got 200. Um, I've just started a new initiative, which is part of my SOEL course, where I've started a running assignment at the start of the class, where I give them an assignment and they have to divide in groups of three. And then we create times in the class for them to work on that. And I think one way one could do it is perhaps to again ask groups to present, but it's difficult to cover all of them. And some of them refuse. I obviously don't <coughs> force them. Would you like? No. I, I'm shy. I don't want to. <coughs> so I think that's a big part as well in a large class too. It needs a lot of courage and so forth. You reward. I give them normally a lint chocolate the guys who present. <laughs> and dark chocolate is good for the heart. <laughs> Thank you also for a, a great presentation. Um, have you I obviously picking up this a lot of this is obviously face to face and seeing as I'm from future then I'm interested have you thought about how you would take more of this online in, in a digital way to maybe do things differently or scale up what you can deliver to more students and maybe increase the participation because you say you're constrained by time I've only lightly thought about it um, I'm not too clued up on the digital system and a bit of a technophobe as well, but I, this, we need this technology. Um, I'm planning I, to launch also a master's course, it's just the sort of thought patterns, with the idea of going online so that we can attract people from the, especially from our continent, because you get a lot of queries and they can't, I can't accommodate them costs. So one way is to go the online route, that you could do a master's or some program, and you come maybe once for a year. Yeah, I'm not sure how you can do, other than quizzes that you see. <coughs> it's a good question for me to think about. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm not expecting enough. It's all quite new, but it's, it's what we. And maybe I can talk time. to you afterwards. <laughs> that, 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 those two over there. And those, those <laughs> two over there. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> how we can bring this across in that world. I think there's definitely a need. There's a, there's it's just yeah. how to... I've thought, of, but, but my, my knowledge is too limited of even apps. And I've just spoken to some of my assistants, the guys, the postgrad students. They also not to... How can we get an app even where they can go outside of the classroom and go on there in a sort of game-like environment it's just how to realize it, and I don't know the cost, I don't know enough about it, but the crude idea that we could go on there and it's exciting and fun because we see our kids all the time, yeah. but they learn physiology <laughs> through that. <laughs> Maybe as part of an option, what something that I, I use in my classes that I find useful is um, on Sunland, we've got a peer review system. So in my particular case, um, students need to do a little project and then they upload a spreadsheet. Um, and then this spreadsheet can be sent to other students who then must rate that, uh, that spreadsheet. So there's a bit of interaction going on there. It's not kind of face-to-face -face necessarily, but um, in my case it's voluntary, so only about 10 or 20% of the class actually participate, but that for me is a, a very valuable um, resource. Just coming on to group learning while we were getting the mic, I'm trying to promote that as well. Like you're saying now, the peer review. That's why this assignment was run, but I see one of the problems, maybe you guys have some answer, is that they, it's a division of labor concepts. <laughs> you divide in groups of three, the idea is obviously you're going to sit down and discuss and generate knowledge like that. But we don't see them, they're away. So maybe I can use this digital. So what will happen if there's eight questions, you're going to do the first three, and it doesn't solve our problem. So that's something I'm also mm. grappling around with. How to force that, but without being so overt, I guess. <laughs> so it's okay. dictatorial. Yeah. <laughs> 
here's a kind of question that I've been grappling with for for a while now is um, is who are we teaching? And I, as I said a second ago, this peer review thing is kind of generally about ten or fifteen, twenty percent of people take it up, and I kind of wonder if that's not a success. So we've got two hundred people in the class, and you said forty of your students actually participate, and for me that's that's fine. You've you've succeeded to to a large degree, and I, and I kind of wonder if wonder if that's you know we. Sh- I wonder if I should not change my thinking to say, well, it's only success if 80% or 90% of the class participate. Maybe we should just really be focusing more a little bit more, focusing a little bit more on the interested student. I want to add to that. So in our classes, my colleagues would have attendance badges system because they believe that. I said I don't want that. The students come when I start my model. I say, I'm not interested. If you adults, and if you don't want to be here, there's nothing I can do at this stage of your career, if I have to force you. So you c- and you lose people, unfortunately. So I don't know which one is right. <laughs> the enforced one, but like you say, you still miss them. My philosophy is always to, if I miss them, I do my best, but I can't save the whole world, unfortunately. And when I gave that assessment and I said they'd respond, in my mind I thought I may get 10. I was maybe too cynical. So when I got 40 or 50, I was very excited. But obviously, how many didn't fill it in? Because there's no incentive. There's no mark towards your test, on purpose also. (laughs) It's purely, you've got to do it to learn, uh, to get that mindset. Because I find the student mindset, it's a deeper question. How can we change that? It's to do with materialism. If you don't give me something in return, I'm not going to do it. So, how to break that mold? Because that lesson outside also, you spoke about general things in life, instant gratification. To try and break that, but then you're going to lose some people because they lose interest. And in fact, some of these open sessions, like you said, You've got to have that timing right, I found. So if you start off and it's toward, I'm starting in the middle of the lecture towards the end, you lose some people. And I don't police that because of the principle if you don't. But now I've, st- I've swapped it around. <laughs> the first 20 minutes, and then we're going to go on with the lecture. So you've actually, you can be smart and, and keep them there. Okay, maybe one last question. I'm watching the time as well. Last questions, suggestions? Ah, oh, Monty, yes. <laughs> I didn't want to put you on the spot, so but I thought I'd make you volunteer. Thanks, Antoinette. Um, I have a background in uh, teaching academic literacies before I started at, uh, at FutureLearn. And one thing I, I noticed is very true that um, for many of the undergraduate students these days, you really need to give them uh, a reason for doing something other than just the sort of the learning exercise itself. They are time poor. More and more undergraduate students these days are holding down one, two jobs. They might be older, they might have family commitments as well. I wondered whether one way of uh, giving them more uh, more reason to invest in this, even in the small activities, is to see if you could incorporate them into some sort of uh, later assessment. So thinking about how they could uh, start to think about problem solving as it might relate to some sort of final summative assessment. You know, things like if it was a, if, if you knew that doing that kind of um, problem solving early was going to help you in your course towards preparing for a larger final assessment might help give them more reason to, uh, to, do, to, to be involved in that kind of activity. I agree, but so at the moment we have formal tests you see, and <laughs> exams, which I don't yep. believe in actually, but um, so I'm stuck with a system. I would have loved that. So in honours I do that, so I work towards some assessment at the end of it, a no test. And, and I'll just share this as at that level because there's 20 in the class. So for the first class, and it's to do with the heart and diet and so forth, I met with them and said, I want now you guys to tell me, you as students, it's going to come to your desk this <laughs> um, what are your What are the problems a St- Stellenbosch University student faces in terms of risk factors <coughs> f- 
for heart disease. <coughs> you discuss it. I had some in mind, obviously. <laughs> and then they came back to me. Right. Substance abuse. Ritalin, I've lear I learned. And weed, alcohol abuse, smoking, diet, all of So there's about six, seven. Right at the start. So then I took, oh, this is going to be what we're going to study for the next three weeks. Smoking. I checked, I think, with JP or Nicolien, and I said, I want you to go and interview, in just go for a chat to one other student about some of these factors. So you get a real. And at the end, and so all the coursework related to this, they've got to produce this summative assessment where they put all the risk factors together, the physiology, and that's why I'm saying, three recommendations to the vice rector, <laughs> what we can do to change it, and three recommendations to the student, student body. I don't want also wishy-washy, you have got to live better, it's got to be grounded. <laughs> In good theory, this is, and I can adapt it like this. And this. So I think that is, that's the way to go. So I, uh, I tried a variation this year where I started at the beginning with an assessment. It's not ideal. And that they had to put it together as we went through the course because I've got the tests that I still have to do the, the old fashioned way. But I fully agree with you, but the system at the moment. <laughs> Great, so all that remains for me is to thank Professor Esop for a brilliant talk, sharing not only your practice but an incredibly useful tool that you're actually using to reflect and analyze what you're doing and, and think about it and doing research about it. And then I know Professor Esop said no attendance registers, but please make sure that you've signed the attendance <laughs> register today. And please also help us by completing our feedback forms. Um, thank you so much for attending. Thanks again, Professor Esop. And I think I forgot to mention at the beginning, Professor Squinwinkle really wanted to be here today because it is his teaching and learning seminars, but unfortunately he's caught up in another meeting between one and two. So apologies for him as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>